chapter 21 um, is covering the body fluids and by now you know that um, we may look um, as a solid um, body however we are made out mainly of, of fluids and uh, the main component of our body is water um, beside this uh, primarily composition of water there are um, a lot of other substances dissolved in it um, as electrolytes um, the salts, nutrients, gases, waste products, um, as along with as well as uh, other special substances as hormones and enzymes. This slide provides you an overview of the current lab lecture that will cover body fluids, uh, including uh, separate compartments uh, as intracellular, extracellular, um, that is made out of the interstitial fluids, blood, plasma, lymph, and other special compartments, water and electrolytes, the regulation of body fluids, including water balance uh, with all its mechanisms, and acid-base balance, uh, including regulation and disorders, types of abnormal uh, pH, disorders, and fluid therapy. Please take a moment and review the learning objectives by stopping this presentation. We'll start by discussing different types of uh, fluid compartments. Um, according to where they are located, the fluids in our body can be uh, classified as being intracellular or extracellular. And in a second, we'll see that extracellular fluid has uh, even more subcompartments. The intracellular fluid, or ICF, it's obviously by the name intracellular, it, inside the cell, it will be that fluid that is contained within the cells. And about somewhere between two thirds and three fourths of all our body fluids will be contained inside the cells. So in other words, most of the fluid in our body will be found in what is called the cytosol. If we are looking to what is called the extracellular fluid uh, or ECF that will be um, will include all the fluids that are not located inside cells and will be um, composed of will be made out of some subcompartments and those will be the interstitial fluid uh, or how we call it in a more simple way the tissue fluid it's that fluid that will be located in all the spaces in between the cells in different tissues throughout our body and this may make up to about 50% of our body weight. Um, a second um, subcompartment will be blood plasma, and this will be about 4% of our uh, body weight. Obviously, blood plasma is the fluid part of the blood. We have the lymph. Um, it's that fluid that will be drained from the tissues um, through the lymphatic system back into the cardiovascular system. That's about 1% of our body weight. And we have what is called fluid in some special compartments. Um, and those special compartments, we discussed them before um, when we discussed other um, uh, systems. And we have in this category the cerebrospinal fluid, the aqueous and vitreous humor of the eye, serous fluid, and synovial fluid that we found um, in, the, uh, in the joints. And altogether, they make up about one to um, three percent of uh, total body fluids. I would like to review very quick um, the concept of osmolarity or the osmotic concentration, meaning the amount of particles that are dissolved in a certain quantity of fluid. Um, so please remember that we were describing that there are selectively permeable barriers that will separate those fluids in different compartments. And um, most of the time, the water can move freely uh, through in between those compartments, um, mainly through the capillary walls inside the interstitial fluid and from the interstitial fluid into the uh, intracellular fluid. As a result of this um, free movement of the water, we'll, we'll have virtually at any given point, we need to have uh, what is called a similar osmotic uh, concentration or a similar osmolarity in uh, both on both sides of a membrane uh, because usually the water will follow um, a higher concentration of the salts of the solids. 
So it is obvious that we start describing um, the water in this function um, as part of the body fluids, knowing that um, most of the body fluids are made out of the water. And um, we look at the water as uh, being a solvent for other particles, being a transport medium, and also being an active participant in metabolic uh, reactions. In addition to that, um, the force of the water traveling through the uh, blood vessels uh, will be the main determinant of the blood pressure. Um, and the blood pressure, um, based on this pressure, will create the gradient uh, for the blood flow at the level uh, at the capillaries and will facilitate, um, if you remember what we're, we're calling the capillary exchange. So if I say that the water is the main determinant of the blood pressure, it's easy to understand how any change in the water volume will produce modification, alteration in the blood pressure. So in, um, as, in general, um, the proportion of body water um, out of a person's body weight will be between 50 and 70 percent, will be um, higher in terms of percentages in young individual and in thin muscular individual. Uh, and as the amount of fat will increase, the percentage of water will decrease because adipose tissue uh, holds only very limited um, amounts of water because again, the adipose tissue is, tissue is fat and the fat is hydrophobic, will uh, repel the water, will not combine well with water. Um, in the same way, we can look at this and say, well, in infants, the water percentage will be even higher, making up to about 70% of their total body mass. Because of that, and by understanding the percentages of water depending on the age or the stage of the nutrition, we can understand how some category, well, we can identify categories of population that will be a high, at a higher risk for dehydration, let's say, as I said before, the infants having 75% of their body weight um, being water, they will be at a higher um, risk for dehydration. A, a second uh, component of the body fluids will be the electrolytes. Um, very important by now, you understand that they are very important um, to for a lot of the functions and they serve a lot of roles um, in a body function. We can define them and separate them into two categories, those that they have a positive charge uh, ion and those that will develop a negatively um, charged ion. The positively charged will be called cations, uh, while the negatively one will be called anions. So we are looking into a few of them. Um, probably the most abundant one in the extracellular fluid is uh, sodium. Uh, and we are looking now at the cations, the positive uh, charged um, ions. Uh, the main role for sodium is to maintain the osmotic balance uh, and the body fluid volume. Um, other roles will be um, it in uh, transmission of uh, impulses through the nerves in nerve conduction and also in maintaining the acid-base balance. The second most important one will be potassium, also a positively charged um, ion. However, the uh, potassium is the, um, the partner, the counterpart of sodium being mostly abundant inside the cell, intracellular. And its main role is in uh, um, participating in the excitability of neurons and muscle cells, um, including the um, heart muscle. Calcium. Uh, will be the next one, also a positive one, is required for uh, bone formation, uh, for muscle contraction. It has its roles as a neurotransmitter um, and um, also participates actively in uh, blood clotting. Magnesium is necessary also for muscle contraction and for the uh, action of some enzymes. Let's look now also at the anions, the negative ions. Um, uh, bicarbonate will play a key role for the acid-base balance. Uh, chloride is the most abundant extracellular ion, uh, and it will take part in formation of the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, and as a result of that, uh, will be uh, an active participant in regulating um, fluid uh, pH. And the phosphate 
uh, essential in the uh, carbohydrate metabolism, bone, bone formation, and also in acid-based uh, balance. Also negatives, uh, negative cations, um, anions, I'm sorry, will be the protein that uh, most of the time will be negatively charged. Um, and they are found in the intracellular fluids um, in, in high quantity. They will be um, also in high quantities in, in the intra, beside the intracellular fluid will be in high quantities also in uh, blood plasma. Um, however, we will not gonna see a lot in, in the interstitial fluid because um, they cannot cross the capillary wall. They are too big to cross through the gaps. There are um, a multitude of mechanisms that maintain the, um, the normal, um, the required ba balance of the body fluids. And um, those mechanisms will be uh, negative feedback mechanisms that maintain both the volume and the composition of body fluids within um, that, uh, what is called a very, very narrow limit. Uh, we are looking now into, we have two processes um, that the water balance can be um, um, throw out of um, equilibrium. One will be the water gain and the other one will be the water loss. So when we are looking into that, uh, we understand that uh, throughout, let's say, a certain amount of time, uh, let's say a day, um, there is, uh, there should be, in order to maintain a, a, a balanced um, uh, mechanism, to have an equilibrium between the water gain and water loss. So there is a um, high variation in, in terms of um, the quantities that um, an individual, uh, quantities of water that an individual will consume uh, throughout the day and sometimes from one day to the other. It will be typically increased um, in hot weather um, and decreased in those days that are cooler. Um, on an average, we can say that on what is called comfortable environment, a temperature that is neither uh, cold nor hot, an individual will um, require about 2,300 milliliters of water, about two and a half quarts daily. About two thirds of this quantity will come from uh, drinking water. That makes up to about um, 1,600 milliliters. Um, in other, um, the rest of the amount of um, fluids will come from uh, food, um, fruits or vegetables or soups, about 700 milliliters. Uh, in addition to that, about 200 milliliters will be produced um, as a result of body metabolism. And if you remember, um, when we describe how the energy, how the um, uh, carbohydrates, let's say, are um, burned out by the cells uh, in order to produce energy, you remember that one of the byproducts, what results from um, the uh, burning, the um, uh, usage of glucose in the cell, um, one of the main uh, byproducts was the water. Now, this water is described as metabolic water, all this um, amount of fluid. And altogether, um, it's about 2,500 milliliter per day. On the other hand, we have what is called the water loss. And again, in an individual that is well balanced and healthy, those two numbers will uh, equal each other um, throughout, let's say, 24 hours. Uh, let's look into how do we lose water. And we have a few uh, avenues. One will be, and the most important one, will be through the kidneys. Um, that uh, Remember that they are filtering a lot of the blood, um, but they are eliminating only about one to one and a half liters of water daily through urine. And this depends on the amount of fluid intake and fluid losses through other avenues. Through the skin, um, obviously the skin is an impermeable um, membrane. Uh, that's how we are describing it. It's a protective layer. And in addition to that, um, it's high composition of keratin and, uh, and the sebum that covers um, the skin will prevent dehydration. However, we have a way of losing water through the skin and um, the water will evaporate uh, from the skin surface where it is produced and it's eliminated constantly by the sweat glands. Um, sometimes the sweat glands may work um, 
may be overstimulated and have an overproduction as a result of exposure to uh, hot environments. Um, however, even when we have a, a normal and comfortable environment, our skin will still lose some water through the skin. So uh, all in all, in 24 hours, we are losing through the skin through perspiration and evaporation of that water about 500 uh, milliliters. The next avenue will be through the lungs. And rem you remember probably that we said that the exhaled air is, um, is uh, humidified and is uh, hot. So um, the lungs will, uh, through the lungs, we are losing about 300 milliliters um, every day. Uh, those losses can be even higher in those patients that are intubated and ventilated. And we need to um, be aware of those numbers and to make sure that we are replacing the loss. Uh, through the uh, digestive tract, we eliminate um, with feces about 200 milliliters each day. And this, when the feces will be normally formed, whenever a patient will have diarrhea, obviously that um, fe the feces in the case of diarrhea will, be, will have a higher concentration of, uh, of fluids. And obviously the patient or the person will, the individual will lose more water. Okay, so we decided that the water intake and the water output, they will need to match each other in order to maintain a constant body volume. So we know that we produce urine constantly. So what will cause us, what will be a mechanism to drive us to um, gain water, to drink water? And, and that, mechanism, um, of prompt, that mechanism that prompts us to drink water, it's called the thirst mechanism. Um, so... The thirst and the drinking um, will be our so-called defense mechanism against uh, decreasing the fluid volume. While the kidneys can also conserve in some way uh, the body fluids whenever we do not have access to a, a source of water. There is a control center for the thirst and this is located in the hypothalamus. Again, is that part of primitive structures of the brain. So it's a uh, it's a primitive type of uh, reflex. The, this center has a, um, a central role in regulating uh, both the total fluid volume and its composition. And let's think what can uh, stimulate this um, center to um, cause us to drink water. One change will be a decrease in blood pressure. When the blood pressure is lower, it means that I don't have enough fluids in the blood vessels, and that will stimulate the center. Another thing that will stimulate your thirst center, and um, every single one of you experienced that at least once in your life, is an, what is called an increase in the osmolarity of extracellular fluid. And the increase of the osmolarity outside the cells is by an increased amount, most of the time, by an increased amount of salt that we will um, eat. As a result of that, the body will feel the sensation of, uh, fit, will have the feeling of thirst and uh, more water will uh, be um, included in our body to dilute and maintain the osmolarity to lower now the concentration of salt because we added salt to our body. Um, the dryness of the mouth will also um, create a sensation of thirst. The excessive thirst, uh, such as that caused by an excessive urine loss, uh, like in um, the situation of a diabetes patient, regardless if it's diabetes mellitus or insipidus, is called a polydipsia. Um, ideally, this mechanism uh, will stimulate us just enough to drink in order to balance the fluid. Um, however, that's not always true, and this is because uh, especially in hot weather and especially uh, when we are, let's say, um, working in the backyard or we are training for a competition, um, we may not drink enough to replace the fluids lost in the sweat. Um, because the sweat, on the other hand, is uh, not composed from out of uh, pure water. It's a combination of water and salt. Uh, so when we are replacing, um, after we are dehydrating ourselves, uh, in hot weather through uh, excessive sweating. And another situation for excessive sweating can be uh, a patient that has high fever um, and in the, uh, 
uh, release period of the fever, when the fever is coming down uh, through excessive sweating, they may lose, again, not just water, but also electrolytes. That's why it is recommended to replace those uh, deficits, not by pure water, plain water, but by those beverages that will have a, a balanced uh, concentration of sodium and other electrolytes in order to uh, maximize the absorption of water from the um, from the bowel. We discuss now how the body is able to maintain the fluid um, homeostasis, the fluid balance homeostasis. And in order to, to be able to discuss that, we need to describe first what is the thermostat for this homeostasis process. Remember that every homeostasis process needs to have a certain thermostat set point uh, pre-established uh, that is our reference point that we are trying to get back to it uh, all the time. And we have a few uh, variables that will be involved in the fluid homeostasis. And those will be, first of all, them will be the blood pressure. Um, and generally speaking, our body is not able to uh, directly sense or regulate the, um, the fluid volume. What the body is able to perceive and regulate is the blood pressure. And the blood pressure is actually um, ha it's determined by the amount of overall fluid volume. Um, as a result of that, the, the thirst center or the kidneys will um, act more or less in order to control and maintain the blood pressure. A second element, a second uh, set point will be the plasma osmolarity. And we have osmoreceptors, those cells that are able to perceive and um, um, send the signal, be stimulated by changes in the electrolytes concentration in the body fluids. Uh, osmoreceptors located in the hypothalamus that will uh, be stimulated by um, a lowering or an increased concentration of blast, uh, blood plasma, especially uh, electrolytes and especially sodium, the salt. And we have a third mechanism that is the plasma potassium concentration um, that function in a similar way to the sodium. So what it's important to remember is that all those three uh, variables, blood pressure, plasma osmolarity, um, the sodium osmolarity, and the potassium osmolarity, they are highly interrelated and connected uh, with each other. Uh, whenever there is an, let's say, an increase uh, in the salt intake, it will generate an increase in the water intake and the retention of both will be increased. Also, sodium and potassium elimination is slightly linked. Whenever the sodium elimination will increase, the potassium elimination will decrease and vice versa. And this is because the body perceives them as positive um, ions, as um, cations, and whenever it's eliminating one, it's saving the other one, um, and uh, the reverse process. There are also um, a number of hormones that will um, help uh, in um, establishing this type of uh, negative uh, feedback, and they are regulating body fluids and uh, blood pressure. So let's summarize the concept that we described before. Whenever I have an increased intake of sodium, that will generate an increased sodium concentration in the blood that will increase the blood osmolarity, the concentration. And as a result of that, will be an increased water retention and or intake. As a result of that, there will be an increased fluid volume that will generate an increased blood pressure. Once you understand this concept, it's really easy to go backwards and understand why in individuals that have um, high blood pressure, the first and one of the most important things that we will recommend is to cut the salt out of their um, uh, diet. And by cutting the salt out of their diet, they are eliminating with that part of the body fluids that will be retained as a result of an increased sodium. And as a result of eliminating the fluids, the blood pressure will lower, will be, will decrease. Aldosterone is the first um, hormone that is involved in the regulation of the uh, body fluids. And um, if you remember from the endocrine system, it is a steroid adrenal hormone 
that is involved in the balance and regulation of potassium and sodium um, cations. Um, aldosterone is um, released is secreted as a result of uh, a low blood pressure at the level of the adrenal gland. Um, the hormone that is called um, angiotensin II uh, will mediate this uh, this effect. And when we'll get a little bit later, when we'll dis discuss a different aspect of the body fluid regulation, we'll discuss this hormone also. Um, as a result of its uh, secretion, the aldosterone will increase the reabsorption of sodium, and as a result of that, the water. Again, aldosterone is involved whenever there is a low blood pressure. So it will reabsorb, it will save the sodium, and once the sodium is saved, the water will follow it passively. And this is done at the level of the distal tubule in the kidneys, in the nephron. As a result of that, it will increase the blood pressure. It's also involved in a second type of um, negative feedback loop that will involve this time the potassium. An increased blood concentration of potassium will directly uh, action of the adrenal gland and will promote the aldosterone release. So the aldosterone will stimulate potassium secretion from the blood inside the distal tubule. And as a result of that, it will increase the potassium excretion. So one, the, one of its mechanism is because the, um, the blood pressure is low. It will reabsorb more sodium, and as a result of that, will attract more water, so the blood pressure will increase. On the other hand, whenever there are high concentrations of potassium at the level of the kidneys, will stimulate the removal of the potassium, and as a result of that will be an increased absorption of sodium. Remember that they go opposite ways in the kidneys. Whenever the kidney is saving sodium is eliminating potassium and the opposite. And by doing that, um, it's lowering the um, levels of potassium that whenever they are very high, they can be dangerous. There is a condition that is called the Addison disease um, in which the adrenal cortex is not able to produce aldosterone. And as a result of that, there will be a loss of sodium. The sodium will not going to be reabsorbed because the aldosterone is not acting. And the potassium will not be excreted also because the sodium is lost. And as a result of that, we have low sodium, hyperkalemia, and loss of water because the water will follow the sodium. Uh, in some cases of Addison disease, the blood pressure can be very, very low. And uh, that associated with very high levels of potassium uh, may produce uh, arrhythmias at the level of the heart that can be uh, fatal in some patients. A second hormone that is involved in the body fluid uh, balance is the antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Uh, it's called also vasopressin. Um, it's secreted from the hypothalamus, from the posterior part of the pituitary gland. And um, the ADH. Uh, will be stimulated, will increase whenever there is an increased blood osmolarity. So what this hormone will do will detect the high concentration of sodium. And as a result of that, what it will do will um, act at the level of the collecting duct and will increase the water reabsorption. It will open a lot of gaps into the collecting duct. And as a result of that, a lot of water will be removed back from the urine, back into the interstitial tissue, um, and it will um, concentrate the urine while the water saved uh, will lower the concentration of the sodium in the, uh, in the system, in the body. Um, in a malfunctioning of this hormone, um, there is a condition that is called the diabetes insipidus. And in this condition, there is an inadequate secretion of ADH, a low secretion of ADH, and because of that, the uh, collecting ducts will not going to have those gaps open, they will be closed, and a lot of very diluted urine, high volumes of diluted urine, will be eliminated daily. You've heard a few times by now the word angiotensin 2, and that's a hormone. Um, and angiotensin 2, it's an important um, 
a factor. It's an important part of the negative feedback that will maintain the fluid balance and um, normal blood pressure. The blood pressure, any type of decrease in the blood pressure will stimulate the production of angiotensin II. And the result of production of this hormone will stimulate the rest of the mechanisms to maintain and increase the blood pressure. The sensors and also the control center for all this um, negative feedback for the angiotensin II can be found, and look in the image, can be found in a region um, of the nephron that is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Um, juxtaglomerular in translation means near the glomerulus. So the first portion, if you look at this, and you can see how you have the wide, the upper part of the, the arterial that gets inside the nephron, the wide one is the afferent, the A afferent one. And the one going out that it's a little bit more narrower is the afferent. And in between them, just in, inside the V that those two structures are making, we have the distal, distal tubule. And the distal tubule, it's kind of curving backward toward the glomerular, um, it just in between those two arterioles. And this is because by making contact with the afferent arteriole, um, they make together, they form together what is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So in other words, the juxtaglomerular apparatus is made out of the afferent arterioles and the distal tubule. The receptors in the distal tubule cells um, are sensors for this uh, negative feedback loop. The sensors will measure the volume of the filtrate, and that gives an information to the body in terms of what the blood pressure is. And those signals um, will be transferred to the afferent arteriole, and this will act as a control center. Whenever the blood pressure, and as a consequence of that, the filtrate, will be low, the afferent arteriole will secrete high amounts of, a, of an enzyme that is called renin. And this enzyme will participate in production of the angiotensin II from some inactivated uh, um, precursors. Any type of decrease in the blood pressure will decrease the filtrate also. I have less blood pressure getting into the glomerule, so I have less filtrate. And as a result of that will be an increase in renin production and as a result of that, an increase in the angiotensin II. Angiotensin has an immediate effect by stimulating vasoconstriction, narrowing of the arterial. And as a result of that, will increase the blood pressure. So in addition to that, by producing vasoconstriction, it will stimulate also the thirst center. And as a result of the stimulation of the thirst, thirst center, we'll have an increased release of both antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone hormone. Both of them are saving the water. So let's review the mechanisms that will uh, participate in maintaining the body fluid volume. Whenever there is a low blood pressure in our body, that will be perceived by the juxtaglomerular apparatus and also by the hypothalamus. Um, and those are both sensors and control centers. As a result of that, will be an increased secretion of, because of the juxtaglomerular apparatus, will be an increased secretion of angiotensin II, and because of the stimulation of the hypothalamus, beside the fact that will uh, be an increase in thirst, will have an increased secretion of aldosterone and ADH. Those all three elements will act at the level of the kidney, and as a result of their action, water will be saved, sodium will be reabsorbed, and the hypothalamus that has an increased thirst sensation will make us drink more water. And those are all effector actions. Those are the effect that those are the corrective actions uh, for uh, maintaining the normal fluid volume. As a result of those mechanisms, there will be a correction in the blood pressure and blood pressure will increase.
you probably realize by now that there are a lot of mechanisms that will increase the blood pressure and maintain the blood pressure and save the sodium and retain the water. And this may seem a little bit redundant. However, they are critical because our body doesn't know how to uh, adapt to low blood pressure. And that can be fatal um, by reducing blood flow to critical organs uh, such as brain. Those tissues can be irreversibly damaged. There is just one element, one hormone that will have an opposite effect of reducing blood pressure or trying to reduce it. And that this is the atrial natriuretic peptide. Um, this hormone will be released by some specialized atrial uh, myocardial cells whenever the blood pressure um, is increasing too much. Uh, those cells will be stimulated by stretching um, the atrial, the myocardial cells. Um, HL natriuretic peptide will um, stimulate the kidney to excrete more sodium and water as a result of excreting sodium. It will be um, an elimination of water as well. And as a result of that, will decrease the blood volume and the result of that will be a lowering in the uh, blood pressure. And you can see whenever in this diagram, whenever the blood pressure is increased, the atrial cells will uh, be stimulated and they will produce atrial natriuretic peptide that will stimulate the kidney to eliminate more sodium that along with the sodium, the water will be eliminated that in consequence will correct the blood pressure. Let's try and summarize again the mechanisms uh, involved in maintaining the blood pressure, uh, especially when that will be the low blood pressure. The low blood pressure will be um, perceived um, in two points. One will be at the level of the kidney at the juxtaglomerular apparatus. As a result of the stimulation of this area in the kidney, the renin secretion will be increased that will stimulate and activate the angiotensin II. Angiotensin II will have several actions. First will be, will act at the level of the hypothalamus, stimulating the thirst center and as a result of that, we will start drinking more water to increase the volume. Also, the angiotensin II will produce an increase of two hormones. One will be at the level of the hypothalamus, the ADH, and the second one will be the aldosterone at the level of the um, adrenal glands. Both of them will act at the level of the kidney and will increase the water retention by increasing the reabsorption of sodium. All these three elements, thirst, ADH and the aldosterone will have as an end result an increase in the fluid volume. On the other hand, a low blood pressure will be felt by the baroreceptors. Baro are the baro meaning pressure, the receptors that are feeling low pressures. And those will stimulate the cardiovascular control center that through the autonomic nervous system will stimulate the heart to pump stronger and faster and will also produce a vasoconstriction. As a result of that, the blood pressure will be increased by mechanisms that do not depend on the amount of fluid in our body. Angiotensin II will also produce vasoconstriction as an added element in order to maintain and increase the blood pressure. So you can see that whenever the body needs to fix something that can potentially be um, fatal, it has more than one mechanism. Some of them may seem redundant. They all work together and uh, will uh, participate immediately in the process in order to have um, a convergent type of, of effect that will increase the blood pressure very quickly. Which of these organs is an important factor in the regulation of blood pressure? A, posterior pituitary, B, kidney, C, liver, or D, bone marrow. An important factor in the regulation of blood pressure is the kidney. We'll discuss now, um, after we uh, were able to um, understand the way that uh, the body fluids are regulated, let's look into the um, acid-based um, homeostasis. Uh, so just to um, summarize a few um, elements, the pH scale, scale will measure uh, how acidic or basic or alkaline a solution is. If you remember from um, 
uh, chapter two, the way that we are measuring the pH on the pH scale is by measuring the concentration of hydrogen ions in a, uh, in a solution with higher numbers indicating a lower solution. It means that low, um, uh, uh, whenever I have very low uh, numbers of hydrogen ions, that will be an alkaline solution or a basic solution. Whenever I have a high concentration, a lot of hydrogen ions, that will be an acidic solution. For our body, um, we can say that we are slightly alkaline, uh, 735 to 745. Um, and this pH needs to be maintained very, very narrow. Our body doesn't like it alkaline or doesn't like it too uh, acidic either. Uh, we can say for sure that whenever the pH is sliding too much toward 7.0 to acidic or 7.7 to alkaline, that is follow, that will be fatal for the individual. Um, we have a few mechanisms, um, a few processes that maintain the acid-base uh, balance. And uh, you remember by now that um, they will involve carbon dioxide um, and uh, also some um, uh, carbonic acids that we have in our, uh, in our body. So we'll look into those uh, composition mechanisms. Um, our body will constantly, um, by uh, performing its metabolic actions, uh, will produce acids. Yeah. And not all of it can be eliminated uh, through what we, the air that we exhale. Uh, the catabolism of fats will produce uh, fatty acids and ketones. Um, whenever uh, we have an intense um, uh, physical activity, that will generate even more hydrogen ions. Um, in addition to that, we have a lot of the alkalines, uh, the bases that are lost in the feces yeah, in the form of uh, bicarbonate ions. And those are, the bicarbonate is secreted in high quantities in the um, small bowel to neutralize the acidic uh, environment that comes from the stomach. So, um, let's see what are the mechanisms that are compensating. Uh, the first one will be uh, the buffer system. Uh, and we define buffers as those substances that will prevent any kind of sharp changes. Um, and they will maintain this uh, relatively constant pH. A buffer is able to either accept or release protons, um, those ions, in order to maintain um, the status quo, the, the steady pH. We have bicarbonate buffers, we have phosphate buffers, uh, and some of the proteins, such as the hemoglobin in the red blood cells and some plasma proteins, all of those are acting as buffers in our body. A second, mechanisms, a second mechanism that maintains the uh, acid base is the respiration. Uh, the respiratory system is able to compensate um, whenever there is an increase in acid production. And we do that by uh, breathing deeper and faster in order to eliminate more carbon dioxide. As a result of that, we also make the blood, we are trying to make the blood more alkaline. Um, now, if we are looking into that, you will say that obviously, whenever there is an excess of, of vomiting of stomach acid, that will produce a more alkaline um, um, pH in our body. And as a result of that, this stimulus to, uh, for my respiration, which if you remember, it was the CO2, the carbon dioxide being very low because I'm losing a lot of acid by vomiting, um, the stimulus to the, to the brain will be lower and lower. And as a result of that, the breathing um, may be slower, less deep and, uh, and slower. And the third mechanism will be at the level of the kidney. Um, the kidney may regulate the pH by both secreting, eliminating, or reabsorbing the hydrogen ions as needed. Um, and by doing that, they are able to create new buffer molecules such as uh, bicarbonate ions. So this is um, this slide is trying to summarize the response to um, acidity. So you can see how uh, whenever there is a lot of 
just look at the container and you can see how there is a high concentration of ions, um, of protons. Those will, uh, the erythrocytes will do two things in the blood. Will first, the hemoglobin will bind the ions in order to eliminate them and to neutralize them. Once they are bound to another substance, they are not harmful to the tissues anymore. And second, at the level of the, in, in the blood, we have the bicarbonate ion that is able to bind each of those, each of those molecules will bind one um, um, ion and will form um, an acid that is very weak and will decompose itself into water and CO2. CO2, it's an easy fix for the body. The body eliminates it through um, respiratory system. The bicarbonate, on the other hand, is produced at the level of the kidneys and used in the blood as the buffer when needed. Also, the kidneys will be able to produce a more acidic urine based on the amount of the protons that are existing in the blood and need to be expelled quickly out as is. So you can see that, again, for anything that can injure and harm uh, and can be fatal to the body, like an acidity um, environment, the body has a lot of mechanisms that they are functioning together uh, and converge into lowering and maintaining the status quo. We'll look now at abnormal types of case. Um, it can be either um, less than 7.35 or over 7.45. Whenever it is under 7.35, this situation is called um, an acidosis. Um, acidosis will have a few um, um, repercussions on our body. Um, it will depress the nervous system, and as a result of that, the patient will present with mental confusion and sometimes in um, advanced cases with coma. Um, acidosis can be the result of uh, any type of respiratory obstruction, because again, if you remember, the, uh, the uh, CO2 is eliminated through our uh, respiratory system and it will be an accumulation of acids in the body as a result of any lung disease that prevents the removal of CO2. Uh, also, the acidosis can be the result of malfunctioning of the kidneys or uh, through prolonged diarrhea. The prolonged diarrhea will eliminate a lot of the alkaline con content of the intestine. So if you remember, the bicarbonate, the alkaline uh, system is also critical in buffering the um, acid. So I will be left in my body with a with an hyperacidic state. Another situation that can lead to um, acidosis will be an um, um, intense uh, physical exercise. So just by saying that, you see that we have two types of acidosis, just like we'll have two types of alkalosis. One will be what is called respiratory because it's related to causes that will uh, produce a malfunctioning of the respiratory system, while the other one will be the metabolic one and will be related to a malfunctioning of the kidneys or any other kind of metabolic condition that will increase the production or will prevent the removal of the um, uh, anion of the protons from the blood. Uh, another example of metabolic condition will be the uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. Um, or it may be seen in uh, situations as starvation. Um, also may result from an accumulation, what is called of ketone bodies, um, that is known as ketoacidosis, um, which is um, an kind of a complication of uncontrolled diabetes. The second alteration of the pH balance is called alkalosis, and is a result of an increase of the pH that is greater than 7.45, uh, just like in um, acidosis, the alkalosis can have two causes, can be respiratory or uh, metabolic. Whenever it is um, caused by um, a respiratory cause, um, is the result of hyperventilation, an increase in the depthness and the rate of the respiration. As a result of that, and usually those situations of hyperventilation, they are uh, produced by anxiety or whenever there is an oxygen deficiency. As a result of that, um, there is an increase in abnormal excitability of the nervous system with tingling and muscle spasms and dizziness. Um, another cause for that, it will be um, 
metabolic condition that is uh, prolonged vomiting um, as a result of losing the acid um, from the um, stomach or in the overuse of antacids that will prevent the production of um, acid in the, in the stomach. Which of the following is an important buffer in body fluid? A. Chloride. B. Bicarbonate. C. Metabolic water. Or D. Aldosterone. An important buffer in body fluids is C. Bicarbonate. Which system is responsible for long-term pH regulation? A. Buffer system. B. Urinary system. C. Respiratory system. Or D. Digestive system. The system responsible for long-term pH regulation is the urinary system. We'll discuss now a few disorders of the uh, body fluids, and we'll start with a condition that is called edema. Uh, and edema is the accumulation of excessive interstitial fluid. Um, anything that will increase um, the fluid pressure or will decrease the osmotic pressure within the capillaries, or whenever there is a compromised capillary wall, uh, will increase the filtration, and as a result of that, more fluids will accumulate in the extravascular uh, system, in the interstitial um, space. Um, in addition to that, if you remember, uh, the excess fluid in the interstitial space will be returned to the bloodstream through the lymphatic system. So, in addition to that, any type of um, um, condition that will impair the return or the lymphatic um, circulation will produce also uh, an increase in the volume in the interstitial fluid and as a result of that edema. And I will give you a few examples. Um, we have um, a condition when there is a backup of fluid in the lungs and that will be called pulmonary edema. Um, and that um, can have a potentially very serious uh, consequences and um, it's um, usually considered a complication of congestive heart failure. Uh, there is usually an uh, interference with the venous return to the heart, um, and as a result of that, there will be an increased cap capillary fluid pressure um, uh, above this level. Uh, kidney failure, uh, that's a common uh, cause for edema um, and is due to the kidney's inability to eliminate adequate amount of urine. Um, lack of plasma proteins, um, because the plasma proteins will uh, provide um, an important part of the um, osmotic pressure, as a result of that, the water will not going to be attracted, will not going to be kept in the vascular space because there is no, uh, no uh, osmotic pressure over there. And as a result of that, will shift in order to equalize the pressures inside the tissues. An increased permeability of the capillary wall, um, as um, we see that in inflammation, in injuries, or any type of allergic reaction that will open the gaps between the cells of the capillary wall and will allow shift of fluids. And um, last, um, as you remember, we discussed the uh, lymphatic system that uh, may be blocked and will reduce the um, excess return uh, of the interstitial fluid to the uh, cardiovascular circulation. Another cause for um, another disorder of the body fluids is called uh, hyponatremia. Uh, and another name for that is the um, water intoxication. And hyponatremia can be defined as a reduced blood sodium concentration. Um, it's usually caused by an excess dilution of extracellular body fluids. Um, and as a result of that, they become what is called hypotonic. They have too much water as opposed to the solute. Uh, some causes uh, of hyponatremia will be an excess of production of ADH in a, in a disorder of the pituitary gland, uh, an intake of excess of uh, dilute fluids that can be either by parenteral, by given uh, in the medical setup, or by, uh, by mouth in some, uh, kind, in some cases when the... Um, the patients are uh, returning, they're trying to drink, instead of drinking balanced um, um, solutions that have electrolytes in them, they will um, have just plain water. Um, as a result of uh, hyponatremia, um, and because the 
the water will move from a hypotonic solution um, into the body cells. There will be a body of body cell swelling everywhere in the body. However, at the level of the brain, uh, the cellular swelling may lead to convulsions and coma and finally death. Um, a third condition will be uh, what is called an effusion. And the effusion is defined of an, is, uh, as an accumulation of fluid in a cavity or space resulting from um, um, access filtration. Uh, effusion can result uh, from high blood pressure uh, from low osmotic pressure of the blood, or um, in cases of inflammation that will increase the leakiness of the capillary. Um, we can have pleural effusions at the level of the pleural space um, um, that will result from a high blood pressure in the pulmonary vessels, um, usually as a result of a heart failure, or in some cases in lung infections or tumors, they are the result of, an, uh, of the inflammation, the local inflammation. Whenever there is a fluid in the pleural space, uh, the pressure of the fluid will, uh, will be so high that the expansion of the lung, if you remember, I was telling you that the lung is extremely soft and will not gonna, uh, will comply to that, will be pressed back inside um, the, the chest. Um, and as a result of that, the inhalation and the gas exchange will be compromised. Uh, we may have effusions at the level of the pericardial sac that uh, will interfere with the normal heart contractions. And in some cases, when it's important, it may even cause a death. Um, there is another place where wherever we have serous membranes, we'll have, um, we can have effusions. Another place where we can um, find an effusion, it's in the abdominal cavity, and it's known as ascites. We see that in cirrhosis or in abdominal cancers. Also, if you remember from malnutrition, we can see that in those forms of malnutrition because those babies, those children will have a lack of protein and the fluids will um, shift out of the blood vessels inside the tissues. Dehydration uh, can be the result of a severe deficit of body fluids and whenever it's prolonged, um, it may be fatal. Um, in terms of causes for that, we may have vomiting, diarrhea, uh, we may have any type of uh, drainage or water loss through burns or wounds, uh, excessive perspiration or sweating, um, and of course, inadequate fluid intake. They, we may have patients that may have an um, inadequate uh, thirst mechanism, especially patients that have um, traumatic brain injuries that may injure that center or patients that had a stroke that um, lead that part of the brain um, with a scar tissue. Uh, in those cases, in cases of dehydration, we may need to administer um, IV fluids in order to correct both the fluid and the electrolyte uh, imbalance. The dehydration treatment is taking us to the last part of this lecture, which is the um, fluid therapy. And uh, fluids can be administered um, intravenously in a, in a vein in some emergencies in some um, certain situations when um, the, um, in order to maintain either the blood volume or some normal body function. Um, they can provide nourishment, they can adjust pH of body fluids or to correct some um, specific fluid or electrolyte imbalances that can be caused by certain um, conditions as any type of surgical uh, procedure or injuries or diseases. If you remember from chapter three, three we were describing the, uh, the basic principles of movement of water in and outside the cells and the fact that the water will follow, the, will try to balance the concentrations across a membrane and will follow the um, electrolytes in order to um, balance the uh, concentrations. So we call an isotonic solution that solution that has a a concentration of particles inside that will not going to cause any type of net intake or loss of uh, fluid from the cell. We define as a hypertonic solution that solution that uh, has a high concentration of uh, particles in it, of electrolytes, and as a result of that, the water will shift from the cell to the extracellular space, and as a result of that, the cell will shrink. In hypotonic solutions, uh, the concentration of particles is very, very low. So there will be a shift of water from the outside, from the extracellular space inside 
towards the intracellular uh, environment. And as a result of that, the cell may swell up to a point that it may uh, burst. Both hypertonic and hypotonic solutions may, uh, when the treatment is um, incorrect um, or um, excessive, may lead to the cell uh, death. In terms of types of solutions that we can administer, we have the most commonly used one is what is called the, the normal saline, or in this uh, solution will have a 0.9% sodium chloride concentration. And this is um, very similar to the concentration of the uh, solutes in our uh, body. So we'll produce no shift. Another type of um, uh, fluid that we can administer uh, contains um, dextrose or glucose in order to provide nourishment. And an example is the 5% dextrose in 0.45% uh, saline. Now, because of the presence of glucose, when we start administering it, this solution will be hypertonic. However, the body starts working and uh, metabolizing the dextrose uh, for metabolic needs. And by doing that, we are left only with the 0.45 saline. So this solution was the dextrose is metabolized, it becomes hypotonic. We have also the 5% dextrose in water, which is slightly hypotonic because now I have the glucose that is dissolved in water only, I have no particles. So what in the previous solution started as a hypertonic one, now I start with a slightly hypotonic one. I don't have any particles to be left once the 5% uh, dextrose, the dextrose was consumed in the process, in the metabolism of the cells. Only, only the water will be left. Um, another type of solution um, is the lactated Ringer solutions that contains more than one type of electrolytes. We'll have inside sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, and lactate. And uh, the electrolyte concentration is approximately equal to, to those of the extracellular fluid. Uh, however, um, it has inside this lactate, and the lactate will be metabolized to bicarbonate. And as a result of that, this lactate will act as a buffer and will help counteracting the, um, the acidosis. And it's a type of fluid that is used in um, types of surgical um, emergency situation as in burns, um, to correct some fluid loss due to diarrhea, um, and it can be used in, in, it was used traditionally for trauma patients. Another type of solution is the 25% serum albumin. Um, the concentration of the plasma um, albumin is five times the normal. Um, this is a hypertonic solution, and as a result of that, will draw fluids from the interstitial spaces into the circulation. So we administer those in those patients that have we administer the um, albumin in those patients that have um, uh, critical um, uh, clinical symptoms of edema as um, uh, cirrhosis patients in order to, uh, especially those that have the liver failure, um, in order to correct, correct the edema. Um, we have also the ability to add small concentration of potassium, especially in those um, three types of solutions that I mentioned before. Um, in, in that to, in order to replace some uh, electrolytes, especially if the loss is through vomiting or diarrhea, if it's a, if it's a loss that is related to the um, gastrointestinal tract. Uh, there are some other nutritional solutions that can be used uh, in order to nourish the patient. Um, they can be um, concentrated solutions that can contain, besides the sugars, also proteins and fats in order to um, uh, allow the patient uh, recovery um, in the process when they are not able to have any type of oral intake.